Um, good morning. So we're just going to, we just want to do a quick kind of half of this, a bit of a show you what's in the guidelines. Five of our chapter authors are here to give just a quick talk through uh, what their chapter covers. And I was just going to explain the general concept, first of all. So this has been um, a few years of work. We set out in about 2018, 2019 to, as a group, as when we were still a task force of about 30 people, to think about how would one even go about trying to cap capture in one guiding document the whole range of human wildlife conflict, from you know any small creature to the big elephant to any context, how would you go about that? And so the, the obvious way to, was to focus on principles of process, basically. And I think that over the years as a group, we've really learned that that is, that is um, the one main entry point for any transferable lessons, any transferable learning. So whatever region you might be working in, whatever human type of community setting, or whatever species, if the foundations of good process are there and familiar, then it becomes about using that as a framework or a skeleton, and then um, adding to that the case-specific details that anyone working in that area knows better than anybody else. So what this tries to do is not prescribe you know, what you do about human-elephant conflict or what you do about um, marine species conflicts or anything like that. It's about what are some of the, the core fundamentals of in the right direction of getting it right. So we'll show you what we came up with and then we want to hear what you think and have a discussion around this and to what extent it, it's applicable also. Um, I'm going to try and show two pages at once here, if it works. No? Okay, that doesn't work. Uh, so we have 32 chapters, which cover, and, and the, the, the structure of it, I'm going to jump to the principles, sorry. Uh, you have all your general introduction, but this is what I want to focus on. So after so we, we wrote 32 chapters and then, then tried to see, well, what, what pattern is emerging here? And it kind of emerged into these, um, this is our first draft of, of five principles. And everything is then slotted into these more or less. Um, and so the first principle that we thought was really, really important is do no harm. And that might seem a little bit unusual. There are other sectors, other um, in humanitarian and medicine sector and so on, where that is a fundamental pr principle. And it's not something that's talked about that much in conservation. But we felt that, especially in human wildlife conflict, which can be such sensitive situations, there is potential to do harm by blundering in clumsily or, or aggravating the situation or alienating communities or creating conflict between groups of people. And so we thought, let's put it right at the front Start with that, um, and so that then, um, and Kate uh, Hill is here to talk about some of, some of the ch initial chapters in that, or one of the particular chapters which is super interesting around the role of the conservationist in all of this, which is really, really important, a bit of a reflection of um, what are you doing in this situation. The second principle is all about deep understanding of context and specific issues, um, and so I think Everyone who's worked on this for some time really understands that every case is so specific, even if it's the same species, even if it's in the same region, and that uncovering the layers and layers of social and political and even ecological patterns and histories is super, super important. So there's a number of chapters on that. The next principle is all about working together, cooperation, collaboration, understanding who the stakeholders are. And often the more you get into this, you you discover more and more stakeholders. It is never one or two, it's usually quite a lot. And the more you uncover it, the more you find out are involved. The fourth principle is about <laughs> integrating good science and evidence base into it, yes, absolutely. But also then linking that into policy and decision making. Because here we're talking a lot about the fact that this is now in the GBF. Um, and that there's national and subnational policies on these issues. And so how do you bring those things together? 
And the fifth principle is about thinking, where does this go in the long run? That we don't create human coexistence projects that are heavily donor dependent, that are dependent on a sort of rescue external situation. That it just, that these, these coexistence models become driven from the inside, from the community, led from the community, um, and how to make that happen. So, we then elaborate a little bit, just in some bullets on what, what I just said in terms of what those, those principles mean. Um, and then there's this kind of attempt, first attempt at a kind of a checklist. And again, a checklist that is trying to mirror these principles and foundational uh, process lessons. And so what we try to do is have a look at, you know, and I, I wonder if this could be quite interesting for, for the bigger picture planning and for, for fun investment into programs and so on to check whether you're getting it right, to, to, to sort of zoom out from the little nitty-gritty detail of a project activity and step back and, and check, are we getting the, the, the skeleton of this right? So these are about, you know, understanding really what kind of level of conflict you're dealing with. Is it very deep-rooted, identity-based, or is it, is it just a practical issue? Thinking about the ethics and the consequences, who should be involved, who is involved, those hidden layers, um, really think uh, using as much evidence as possible or carrying out studies needed to understand the, the really the ecological and the land use factors, understanding the social, the cultural, the political background, the history. History is so, so important. It shapes how these things um, unfold and, and resentments that bubble up and are expressed through anger over wildlife, that kind of thing. Um, planning with those who are living with wildlife, not helicoptering in um, and saying, well, let's plan this for you. And then, uh, what else have we got? Working across disciplines and across sectors. Again, this whole conference is about that. Practicing doing that as much as possible. Using evidence of all sorts, and that's not <laughs> just the, the classic hard data biological evidence, but the social evidence and the soft evidence. Um, and also the evidence of just sensing whether something is working or not. I would call that evidence too, and it's often ignored because it's not hard data. If something you've tried over and over and it's not getting traction, it's being rejected, I would call that you know, qualitative evidence if something isn't quite right there. Um, Incorporating governance um, and uh, policies, of course. What have we got there? <laughs> Sustainable pathways is all about um, jointly led knowledge, so that comes back to work through and with communities. And then, of course, an exit strategy in what, whatever form appropriate for the local case. So what happens when funding runs out or how do you actually gently transfer over so that it is truly community-led and sustainable. Okay, that's about, that's roughly the framework of it. And then here, well, I'm not gonna flick through the whole thing, but this is kind of roughly how we divided up the chapters into those five principles. And so I think what we're gonna do is just sample a few of those and have some of the lead authors who put a lot of time into trying to figure out, these are really short chapters. They're about 1,500 to 2,000 words. Um, and they are really trying as best as possible to keep it very practical and all around implementation. So not you know, overly theoretical or anything like that. Um, and so we really wanna hear what you think and just first reactions, because I doubt anyone's ever read the whole thing already. Um, but it is also intended to be something that you can dip in and out of, right? It's, it's not intended to be read cover to cover. It's intended to understand the principles and then use the pieces that are relevant. Um, so yeah. And what we want to do after the, these chapters presented is talk about what, you know, just get some initial feedback and then talk about how, can, um, how do you want to use this? Is there, does it generate any ideas? Can we build on this? For example, there's a whole set of case studies that have been developed um, by James Stevens, Christina Rodina, and others that 
there was a session on yesterday and they're all online. And what else might we do with this? So just want to hear ideas and have a chat about how to involve everybody in this. Any initial questions, reactions? And then I'll, yep. Thank you. Well, first of all, congratulations for putting all of these together. Um, it's really helpful. Um, I have a question about how to integrate this into policy. Um, I don't know if you can give us like a background on what have been the biggest challenges on like working with governments to integrate this into a policy. And if there is any way of how of, or pathway into start translating these policies or like this initiative of putting in the policy into funding for actual projects in the field because coming from, from Latin America, uh, especially Mexico, we have great policy, but we actually do not have that level of policy reflected on the field. I'm sure this is similar in many other countries. But if there, is there going to be any kind of like accountability going on on that, working now with the GBF? Yeah, um, so of course it is not yet integrated into policy because it was published yesterday. Um, but of course this is one of the sort of things to try and encourage, but also anyone from governments in the room would love to hear once you've had a chance to look at it. And over the next months actually, you know, any feedback of is this useful? And it's the big question of, is this useful enough across, because we're trying to cover a bunch of different audiences here, that's also very difficult. Um, but I think, you know, in my mind, an indicator of success if, would be that it does get adopted, or, or elements of it, you, if you start to see them popping up in either policies or in strategies, or in maybe the criteria of funding organizations, then that means it's resonant, it's making sense. But let's see. And in terms of, I mean, if you think for a, a parallel example is the um, guide, IUCN guidelines on translocation introduction that have been around for a long time. So nowadays, you know, you wouldn't, as a funder, for example, fund a translocation in that where the application doesn't refer to having understood those principles. And so if we see that happening here again, I would feel like we're in the right direction. But this is the first attempt, you know, and it says first edition for a reason, because we really would, would want to do a second edition at some point after trying it out for a while. Uh, one more question, then I'll. Thank you, Alex. Uh, I'm Adam Gergen. I'm from the RSPCA in the UK. And I, I like the fact that we've done the guidance. I like where it's come from. But I have to say one of the things we live with all the time are the challenges of human-wildlife conflict coexistence in this country. The classic I always have in my mind is urban foxes. Foxes living in communities, which actually perhaps don't operate in communities, as some people might like to think, in that they're disparate households. They won't know each other. Some of them may talk to each other. It's a very different way of looking at the problem, but humans have to learn to live with wildlife, regardless of where they are, regardless of the conservation status of the species that we're looking at. So I think these need to apply across the board. Mm -hmm. It shouldn't just be on a conservation basis. It should be on the, the species can be common. But how do we, in westernised countries, learn to live with the wildlife that comes into our cities, lives alongside us, as well as looking at how other communities across the world live with wildlife that say we might like to see as tourists. Yeah, um, so we didn't write this with only endangered species in mind, absolutely not. So, I mean, but see, um, whether it, uh, this is the big test now. Does it apply to all the range of cases that you're familiar with? Um, and that's what we'd like to see. But no, not necessarily. I mean, what we've always said, um, in terms of defining human wildlife conflict, that it is not limited to species that are of conser conservation concern. It's just that when it involves species that are threatened in some way, the stakes are often elevated or escalated because there's more argument about it, because more people care. And so it usually just the fact that a species is endangered, that kind of amplifies the situation. It doesn't mean that it doesn't affect more common urban species and any other species, really. Right, who are we going to start with? Kate. 
Are you going to tell us about the role of conservation? Okay. So the section that we've been working on is um, introducing some ideas from social science into um, the, the guidelines because some of what we're thinking about is sort of, it's not necessarily things you can take action on, but it's things that um, as conservationists or people interested in wildlife management, there should be elements of thinking about this. So some of what I'm going to mention for anybody who's trained in social sciences will be already embedded in your practice, your thinking. For those of us who come from a more natural sciences, conservation science background, some of these ideas, perhaps particularly the idea of considering positionality, is likely to seem quite um, alien. So what we wanted to do is introduce ideas, first of all, this idea of positionality, and I'll come back and explain, but then thinking about some of the different, um, the different roles of the conservationist, because one of the things you see in many conflict scenarios is um, a list of stakeholders, and one of the sort of obvious groups of stakeholders that's missing is the conservationist, because obviously, as conservationists, we are one of the groups of stakeholders. Similarly, as a researcher, and I move between those two, I'm also a stakeholder. And that's important. And then to think about what are the implications of this, particularly in the context of working with conflicts and in situations perhaps working to try and transform conflicts. Taking into account those things I've said about myself, those are all things that influence the ways in which I think, feel, respond to things. But in, alongside that is my the influence of religion or lack of influence of religion, my political beliefs, my life experiences. Now, those are things are really important. When I start to think about the research I do, it influences the questions I ask, what I see as important, how I ask those questions, and even more important, how I interpret those responses. So understanding something and reflecting on one's own positionality to understand some of the limits and biases we all bring to everything we do helps us understand some of the conflicts that can arise in terms of interpretation, understanding, positions and values. And those are some of the underlying problems in dealing with conflicts. And it's not just with other stakeholders, it's amongst the group that you work with. So we're just encouraging people to think about that and think about the baggage that they bring to the table. The other thing about conservationists and the kinds of roles we take on is bringing this back to the fact that we are stakeholders and we need to be aware of that because it affects not just the way we react but the ways that other stakeholders see us. And one of the things you do see is this idea that conservationists sometimes are taking on roles of mediation that require a neutral figure. But we are not neutral. We cannot be neutral. And even if we can behave in an impartial way, we are not going to be seen as neutral by other stakeholders. And so it's thinking about these things, and that's the purpose of this particular section, to encourage people to think about these ideas, reflect on them, and think about how they influence the kinds of responses they get from people and the ways that they work. I think that's enough, and I'm sorry I had to shout at you. So John Linnell is going to talk about a chapter on how you rapidly assess impacts and what to look for there. So when it comes to positionality, I wish I could adopt Alex's elegant position here. But I'm afraid my position, I can't really manage that elegance, so I'll try and stand more upright. But I do think quite a lot about positions <laughs> standing here at the podium. So in the last 20 years or 30 years, our understanding of conflict has really changed enormously. Like in the, those of us who started out in life as ecologists really approached it you know, from this natural science point of view. And then, for like 20, 30 years, we've been exposed to social scientists like Kate, you know, shaking us up and making us kind of rethink about conflict in a social, cultural, historical context. And this has really been very important and has transformed 
our ability to address conflicts. But what I want to do now, though, is just pull us a little back a bit to the origins and just to underline the fact that we shouldn't forget that behind these complex conflicts are actually some real you know, physical impacts on the ground where there are things that you can put your hand on and you can hold them and quantify them. So a conflict has often started with some form of impact, right, where wildlife affects people directly. You know, we have all these really you know, classic cases like wolves killing livestock, about antelope and wild boar destroying crops, uh, collisions between vehicles and herbivores. These are all very real things, you know, sharks killing people, tigers killing people, you know, large grey animals that we shall not mention by name with big floppy ears, damaging crops, buildings and people. So these are very real impacts with very real consequences, often fatal, if not on your economics, actually on your life and health and safety. And we really must not lose sight of this, that there is this real impact behind conflict. Beyond those kind of direct impacts of something being killed or destroyed, there are also indirect impacts. And these are much harder. Like, for example, if a livestock herder loses an adult ewe from his flock, okay, he's lost a certain one animal, but that ewe was breeding stock. So there's actually knock-on effects going down the chain on his ability to breed. Um, it can even be an awful lot of discussion about whether there is actually a stress effect on livestock from a carnivores and stuff. So documentation of these type of effects is much harder, but they're certainly they're talked about and they're very much part of this discourse. One of the other impacts is the opportunity costs. That if you are having to relate to living in a landscape where certain prob kind of problem-causing wildlife exist, you simply cannot do some things or else you have to do things in a different way, which force all sorts of additional costs onto you. For example, if you are a sheep farmer in a landscape without any predators, you don't need to supervise them 24 hours a day. But if you're a shepherd living in a landscape with large carnivores, suddenly you're having to invest 24 hours of labor seven days a week, which is imposing a dramatic opportunity cost on you. You cannot do other things. You're spending all your time doing that one thing. And finally, you have these psychosocial impacts, where people, some people are quite kind of relaxed about living in proximity to large, dangerous, and damage-causing animals, but many people are not, especially in landscapes where these animals are actually coming back after absence. And here, the psychosocial costs of simply fear and anxiety can be very important. So these are the four categories of impact that we really should not lose sight of even if we really have to interpret them in this wider context. The good thing is that this is not a field starting on a blank page. But kind of for decades, even centuries, kind of the sciences of pest management, of wildlife management, have been finding ways to deal with these impacts. Agricultural science has been dealing with this. So there's a huge body of literature and experience, normally outside the field of conservation biology, but well-established within its own disciplines, which is directly relevant and can be transferred over to addressing impacts. Um, in light of the question that we had earlier about kind of foxes, this is also is a classic example as to where we're not only talking about endangered species. In fact, very often we're talking about common and abundant species. Like wild boar or wild pigs are probably going to be the most impactful sort of species out there on agriculture across the planet, yet no one is talking about a conservation program on wild boar or wild pigs. But it doesn't mean they're not a very important species to deal with in the human wildlife conflict world. A final point to bring up is this issue of assessment. And assessing conflict, sometimes it can be very easy, like a dead sheep is a dead sheep, right? But who killed it? You have a dead sheep lying in front of you, you can document it's dead, but trying to document who actually killed it can be a very complicated and very controversial issue. Even when you have access to DNA technology and autopsies, it's difficult. When you're standing in the field in 40 degrees of heat and the sheep is gradually blowing up in front of you, it can be very difficult to establish whether it got killed by a lion or died of anthrax or something else. So the assessment is very hard. With crop raiding, it's incredibly difficult to assign damage and costs to crops. So 
it's an area which is very amenable to a natural science or e economics approach, but it is will, it is very full of challenges to quantify, much harder than we actually think. So really this is a challenging field, it's important and it's, it's the one that's awfully visceral, you know, but um, so we must not lose sight of it at the same time as we do expand our understanding of conflict to include this wider range of issues. So, thank you. Are we taking questions? Yep. So, any, any questions or comments? Yes. Hi, I'm Ardian from Indonesia. So, I was wondering, like, it's not easy to assess the impact of conflict. Direct impact would be easier. But like, I was wondering about intangible costs, like, uh, intangible costs, like uh, impact on the psychology of the community impacted by the conflict. Mm -hmm. Um, like, if we want to inform the government to make a large-scale policy, sometimes like we cannot use only a, stay, a case study in one or two villages, but we need like an information from a large landscape. I'm wondering if, like, in this chapter, you would be uh, there is any framework for us to uh, assess the intangible impact across a large landscape <laughs> on how conflict could impact people's psychology, health, and opportunity. Yep. That's very challenging, and okay. I was wondering yep. if this will be addressed in this. Um, we do talk about, very briefly, about the need for sort of a transparent assessment. But I think in the other chapters, we get into this much more, where we're talking about the economic instruments. And it is actually an open question as to whether quantification of damage across large landscapes is actually necessary. Now, there are economic models where you say pay for risk, Rather than paying for damage and having a huge transaction cost to quantify it, just skip that and just pay people for the risk of living in the presence of damage causing wildlife. So your point is really important, but there are mechanisms that in some contexts maybe bypass the need for addressing those challenges. But this is where you have to view these guidelines holistically. And actually, Alex says, you know, you can pick and mix, but I would really encourage people to view them as a whole document because the answer to some questions comes in later sections. <coughs> Any more questions or comments? Good. Thank you. Oh, Simon. Um, no, in response to your, to your comment, um, there's a session this afternoon, I think it's just after lunch, Alex, the, the GBF session, where we a whole bunch of people are going to be talking about these challenges of how you, how you assess what metrics should be used, whether, to your very good point, you know, is it possible or practical to assess those um, opportunity costs and other indirect costs, or whether there are other potentially um, slightly different approaches which arguably integrate some of those things like measuring tolerance and so on. So if, if people are interested in that very important question that you brought up, I encourage them to come to that session about the metrics for the GBF after lunch. Mm. Great. Thank you. Thanks for plugging the session later as well. Yeah, so as John said, pick and mix, but definitely read his chapter. Um, and so what we have, there's quite a... I think the authors of this probably come from around 15 or more different disciplines. Um, and so we have social scientists, humanities experts, some, some dialogue, peacekeeping type of uh, expertise in here as well, and of course, lots of natural science as well. So Josh Plotnick is going to talk a little bit about his chapter of how does animal behavior shape these situations. Morning, everybody. Um, show of hands, how many of you think that human-wildlife conflict refers to conflict between humans and wildlife? It sounds like a weird question, but be confident. Well, that's what I thought, but apparently that's not true. So when I, um, when I was first, uh, I was, and I was honored and humbled to be recruited to the task force very early on, about five or six years ago. Um, so I, I'm honored that, that Alex saw, kind of had a vision to think about the importance of animal behavior. Um, but that meant that we were involved in heated discussions initially about what the definition of human-wildlife conflict was. 
Um, and if you haven't, I think Alex mentioned this at the first session yesterday, but if you haven't reviewed what the guidelines mention as the, the definition we've agreed on, it's um, human wildlife conflict is, uh, refers to struggles that emerge when the presence or behavior of wildlife poses actual or perceived direct and recurring threat to human interests or needs leading to disagreements between groups of people and negative impacts on people and or wildlife. So um, the consensus definition among many of the social scientists and, and other people in the room was that human wildlife conflict in fact refers to conflict between people over wildlife issues and that's because wildlife are not effectively party to conflicts and that's because when animals are doing what they naturally do conflict occurs because people don't like what they're doing right so people get into conflict with each other it could be government officials conservationists NGOs local stakeholders they're upset about what's going on about the animals but people have different perspectives and different positions about how to deal with it and that's where the conflict occurs it's not conflict with the wildlife because the wildlife are just behaving the way they naturally do and so this chapter tries to ensure that people consider a the fact that that can be true in many different conflicts involving specific species where you might look at it at the population level, the fact that animals do certain things, they have certain predator-prey interactions, they have certain movement patterns, they move in certain ways, they forage in certain ways, and while that might involve human disturbances, so for instance, animals going and raiding crops, that's just naturally what animals do. It is their, um, their expression of their natural foraging behavior. So what this chapter explores is specifically how people should consider animal behavior, both at the population level, but also at the individual level. And that's really where that definition debate began, because I argued as a, someone who studies elephant behavior and cognition, that in fact elephants can be party to the conflict sometimes. Meaning that sometimes intelligent species, particularly at the individual level, make decisions where they engage with people in a way that results in aggression between those two species. So uh, we had an animal behavior session yesterday. I mentioned uh, an anecdote. I don't know if there's a lot of data behind this, but an anecdote of, of people in Asia, in particular India, I've heard this example in Thailand as well, of elephants that go into crop fields, destroy the crops without actually eating them. And this is typically more prevalent in locations where the conflict has been much more um, negative. There's been elephants or humans killed, for instance. So whether or not there's data behind that, we don't know, but it suggests that the conflict may, in fact, be between humans and elephants. So just very briefly, um, so obviously this is just a, a, a background on the fact that in, in considering animal behavior in, in, in human elephant and human wildlife conflict, you have to think about not only the animal at the population level, meaning can you consider naturally how these animals um, at a species level behave in a certain way, but also at the individual level. In other words, certainly I'm sure you know of many conflicts where at the individual level you have specific problem animals. Right? If you go into a local community quite often with um, any species, I've heard this about crocodiles, I've heard it about elephants, there are specific individual animals that people can refer to either by name or description. Um, and those problem animals have unique personalities, potentially unique cognitive abilities, and that needs to be considered as well. And so in, this, in these guidelines, basically what we're trying to do is to get people to think very specifically about animal behavior when they are considering how to mitigate human-wildlife conflict. So we give some examples about how to consider animal behavior by thinking about species like lions, elephants, obviously you can read this later, crocodiles and bears. And then we go through a step-by-step -step guide if you are a stakeholder and you know of specific situations where behavior or cognition are really crucially important in trying to figure out whether or not to mitigate this conflict by taking that into consideration. So step-by-step you know, -step we talk about considering ecological factors, considering animal behavior factors. Um, thinking about conflict both more globally, so for instance, if you have a particular conflict, can you think about other conflicts that involve similar types of animal behavior, at the species or the population level? And if not, how could your specific conflict inform other conflicts that specifically involve a particular species? So uh, just to kind of summarize this, I really am trying to get people who don't normally think about the behavior of the animal as being crucially important to mitigating conflict to start to do that. And I think that involves both scientists, but it also involves 
complementing that with traditional knowledge. I'm sure any of you that work with local stakeholders know that communities know these animals better than we do. Um, and that means that consulting with them and learning about the animal at the, again, I keep saying individual and population level. What I mean by that is the fact that an individual animal has personality, it has cognition, it has behavior, and you can complement that with what we know about a species more generally. So if you take anything away from this, it's the fact that human-wildlife conflict requires that you think about both the human perspective in the conflict but also the animal perspective. And while we try to protect the animal in these conflicts, we don't often try to put ourselves in the shoes of the animal, as it were. And so that's just something I want to make sure we consider moving forward. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, John. I was just wondering, do you, in the guidelines, consider anthropomorphism? Because there are times, your elephant example is quite interesting, but there are times when people will put human attributes into animals to say they did this vindictively. So do you address that in the guidelines? That's a really good question. Um, honestly, I, I can't remember if we did or not. Um, that's a really important point, and something we should probably consider in the future. Um, so, oh, I'm sorry. Um, so, I mean, I, I, I don't mean to sound pedantic, but if you, anthropomorphism is, as, as he said, um, projecting human behavior or thoughts onto animals. So, you know, when you say, oh, my dog was um, feeling really bad about, you know, something that happened in my house, that's, that's an anthropomorphism. Um, and quite often I think that people anthropomorphize animals, which can be a positive in the sense that it creates empathy between humans and animals, um, but it can also sometimes be a negative because it um, makes it more difficult to really consider the animal's perspective if all you're trying to do is project human perspective onto the animals. Um, so I think, I think we should address that more, if maybe in a future edition or if we write this up in the future, to kind of talk about what the positives and negatives of thinking about the human perspective and projecting onto animals. But I think quite often scientists see it as a negative, um, and it is not always a negative. So I think balancing those two would be important. Thank you for that question. Thank you. Um, great. I'm really looking forward to digging in to hear more. Uh, I appreciate what you were saying about the uh, animal perspective. And I was thinking uh, maybe in an, the next edition or an addendum, having something in there about welfare guidelines or welfare frameworks is a way to maybe, do you think that might be a way to help people assess the animal perspective using like a five domains framework maybe? So I think this would be a great session for another conference, and we could probably have a whole debate about this. I mean, I think there is a debate in the conservation world about how welfare and conservation overlap. I think there are conservation, I don't have to get into this, but I think some conservationists would, would not want to consider welfare um, at the individual level, and some conservationists would. I think there are, there are emerging fields about how to consider that five domain framework. Um, but let me put it this way, I think that discussion needs to be had. So I would definitely agree with you that having the discussion about how to consider the welfare of the animal, particularly in these conflicts, would be an important thing to include in future iterations of this. But it's a debate, it's an ongoing debate, so I think we should continue to have that discussion. Yeah, uh, thank you. Um, yeah, the question I was going to ask is slightly linked to the question about anthropomorphism. Because I wonder in terms of, and it's also linked about to, the, to the, the stance about positionality, I wonder about how the language that we use influences our position on these issues um, and how, how, how the, sort of the, the negotiations and discussions go with our stakeholders. In particular, for example, the term which we all use of crop raiding, I think is such a loaded term. It yeah. sort of has a level of intentionality on the animal. And does that influence how we engage with stakeholders? Yeah, Dan, thank you for that. I mean, I think that's a brilliant thought. I mean, I think, I think what, um, yeah, I mean, first we have to really think very carefully about that. And I think there are some animal behavior researchers who um, don't like to use crop rating, they use crop foraging, which again, kind of hones in on the fact that this is a natural, naturally occurring behavior that the animals typically do. I think the reason I, I'm very conflicted about how to approach anthropomorphism is the fact that it's easy for an elephant. It's not easy for species that are 
maybe consider, we talked about pests, but a crocodile, for instance. I don't think people necessarily have the same empathy for reptiles and amphibians or bats or insects that they do for elephants or apes or cetaceans. And that makes us nervous because if you, if you anthropomorphize one species but not the other, then people start to think, especially, I think, and I've noticed this at, at the government level, like, okay, well, this is a species that's very much like us, so we should protect it. This is a species that's not very much like us, so maybe we shouldn't. Um, I, didn't, I think not everyone ag agrees with that, but that's just a, a concern we should have um, when we think about not only the terminology that we use to describe the behavior, but also the terminology we, we use to describe the animal and their cognition and their intelligence more generally. Thank you. Hi. Oh, please. <laughs> Hi, sorry, yes, I, I like the fact that you picked up on the positionality aspect, and I'm one of the people who's written about why I think we shouldn't use crop raiding as a term, we should stick to crop foraging, unless we have good evidence that there is a different kind of intent or motivation behind the behavior. So I'm open to the idea that there could be, but I haven't yet been presented with evidence that I'm willing to accept for most animals. Elephants might be the one I would accept. But the, this whole thing about anthropomorphism, I think there's some interesting work uh, in, within social anthropology, actually, about this idea that perhaps we should understand it slightly differently and think about it. The term that's used is anthropocentrism. The idea that actually, because we interpret our own social relationships, and that's how we understand interactions and relationships is as humans interacting with one another. We have the language that we use to explain and, uh, and denote human interactions with other humans. It's no surprise that we then use that language when we're talking about interactions either we see between different animals or between humans and animals. It does, though, influence some of the ways we think about it, but if that's our understanding framework, then it's not really a surprise. It doesn't necessarily mean it's accurate, but it's, it seems to be something that we see also cross-culturally. It's not specific to particular languages, particular cultures. So it's an interesting thought. Sorry, we've had you know little time to actually go through and read this whole document so far, so this may be in a totally different part, but I'm wondering if uh, when you're looking at animal behavior, you're also assessing the motivation for what starts or triggers these conflicts. And um, I can give you an example with wolves in the Northern Rockies that almost always we can turn and point to something that actually changed in the environment that triggered um, some type of attractant um, that would trigger their behavior. And so when you're looking at assessing a conflict based on the animal's behavior, you know, having a better understanding of what changed to create that reaction in the environment. Um, and wondering if this chapter goes into that or if that's covered somewhere else in the, in the document. There's a test now, which chapter was that? I think it's chapter 17. There's the ecological drivers chapter by Mayuk uh, Chatterjee and all. So I'm just, I should know the numbers off by heart by now. But yes, it is. So there is a chapter co just considering all that, like where does the whole ecological system, how, does, how do these situations emerge, emerge? And then there's another one on uh, thinking about the whole landscape and how that changes under different policies and so on. Thanks very much, Josh. Really nice to see so much interest in this. Um, if it's a very quick one, and who is it for? Josh, come back. Um, going back to the animal welfare, in some of the cases that I've seen in Northern, Cal uh, Northern California, welfare can directly be linked to conflicts, and that, especially with the carnivore, um, it can't hunt its natural prey. So then it's, it becomes possibly a perceived public safety threat by the public, not saying that it actually is a public safety threat, but it can develop in that way. And it, be, it comes down to starting as an animal welfare case. Is there any th guidelines in this about linking animal welfare to perceived public safety threat? 
and eventually a conflict animal. Yeah, so there, there, there's considerable attention to public safety in the guidelines. Again, I, I think, I don't want to get hung up on the term welfare because I think we could, and I'd love to talk to you. Yeah, go ahead. So like the behavior being exhibited is definitely a case for the possible welfare that leads to this. Are you talking about the welfare of the animal or the welfare of the public? The welfare of the animal. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, again, I, I think the, the question, so we don't address that, and I think it's important. We don't address it very specifically, because again, I think, I think what we're trying to do here is just to encourage people. It's a first level document to get people to think about animal behavior more generally when they're thinking about mitigating conflict at a, at a, at a individual human wildlife conflict level. Um, but I, I guess, again, I think we should, I'd love to talk to you more about this in the RSPCA group as well, because I think when I think about welfare, I think about it at the individual animal level, whereas this document discusses the individual animal, but not necessarily the welfare of the animal. Not that it's not important, it's very important but it's not necessarily what the purpose of this particular chapter is in terms of guiding people to think about it. Thank you. Um, I'm glad to see how much, uh, how much thinking this is already generating. That's exactly what it's supposed to do. I just wanted to add in that there's another chapter um, on the media and working with the media and, and it just reminded me, which Virat Singh is going to talk about, tomorrow we're repeating the session with f five other chapters um, and he's going to show us that one because this is also these use of words and how the effects uh, of those. Okay, Sogi Roy is going to talk to us about his chapters on response teams and Lethal, are you going to combine a couple of chapters? So, uh, thank you very much. I was dealing mostly with the, some of the how, how to do stuff chapters, um, rather than the more principles-based ones. And uh, I'd just like to say that the whole writing, it's learning by doing, this was learning by writing. Uh, the multidisciplinar multidisciplinarity of the whole thing, the, the principles, these permeate all of the chapters and all of the other chapters somehow link to the other. So this is what I'm going to get to now. So first of all, we have conflict, and I was writing a chapter on response teams. How, how do we manage conflict when it's un being carried out, when it's happening? Um, there's a lot of scenarios. There's a lot of situations. It happens all around the world. Bears walk into cities in Italy all of a sudden, and there's panic in the streets. and you know, you need something to, some way to deal with it. Tigers go into villages or sugarcane fields or start attacking people. Um, and often that, that's a very volatile and fastly escalating situation. And we often use this catch-all term response team. Um, whose responsibility is it? Find out whose, whose responsibility is it? You need to manage not just the animal through animal behavior techniques, for example. Um, but also the crowd. Sometimes you've seen videos of people throwing fireworks at elephants when, when they come too close and stuff like that. You need to manage both sides of the fence, as it were. Um, and this chapter dealt with how, you know, how to prepare response teams. You don't just ring up your friends and say, can you help, we've got this. You have a team ready. They're equipped with crowd management techniques, tools, training, whatever. Um, and also animal ecologists, behaviorists, um, who know how to find the animal and the escalation doesn't happen. So the animal, the conflict doesn't get worse. So there's a series of thresholds and criteria where you call upon response teams who are locally knowledgeable and species knowledgeable and well re respected by the community. And it's not just two or three ecologists, it's a very multidisciplinary team that comes in. That then led me to writing the other chapter, which is a bit more controversial, and that's lethal control. Now, I've, I've known Adam Grogan for a while, actually, and he knows me as somebody who's killed a lot of things, because I used to work on invasive species. So um, I actually learned a lot, again, just writing that chapter. The chapter isn't how to kill something. Okay, None of the chapters are how to do this and how to do that, but it, they're more based around 
how you should think about approaching it, what steps you need to take, what, what measures and criteria and thresholds you need to look at. Um, so the first thing is, why should we kill something? When do we kill something? So um, the chapter focused on things like um, when the, the threshold of tolerance was a little bit, um, it, it was exceeded, um, it was an, uh, an animal that's very dangerous either to people or livestock. Um, and we, f we took examples from around the world, uh, and the best ones actually came from Italy with this bear example on how to deal with these problem bears. And, and it escalates all the way through to scare it away, try all the different options, make sure you keep your chickens and, and sheep locked up at night, all the way through to um, response teams. And then if it goes beyond the point of no return, you do have to kill something. Um, and there are criteria in there. And one of the things, as I was sort of unearthing some of this literature, is you have to, there are certain rules you have to follow. You have to be able to identify the species, but also the individual. Um, if it's something like a leopard, or especially a tiger, I mean, tigers have their own barcodes, so it's not hard to identify the individual. You can, uh, you can deal with that animal. But at the same time, that's an ecological, practical, solution there and then, but you have to think of the ramifications. The humaneness of it, the professionalism with which something is killed. If you don't kill it, it you properly, humanely, quickly, uh, you create a bigger problem and the animal runs around attacking more people and it becomes even worse. Um, there's ethics you need to follow, there's welfare concerns you need to follow. In the UK, I tried to put into the chapter some of the Home Office guidelines, because when you do lethally control animals, there are rules you have to follow. Different countries, different continents and regions have their own legislation or not. Um, but there should be some uh, homage to that. And then there are other unintended consequences. Sometimes you kill an animal and another one comes in, and then another one comes in, or you create population effects, um, you change the behavior of a population, the wild boar situation in Italy, for example, is a classic example. You kill some wild boar and you create a population of very scared remaining boar that are much more difficult to control and still can do as much damage. So you need to deal with um, animal behavior. So you, know, you, you learn a lot of things about the species that you're actually controlling. You need to manage the, me the media. Um, and I'm going to say something paradoxical here. Sometimes dealing with a problem lethally is actually good for conservation because you end up, if you do it professionally and kill the right individual, you stop the conflict in the region, in that locality, getting worse. Um, you appease the local public. They think something's happening. Um, they don't take it into their own hands to go off and indiscriminately kill everything they see. Uh, and you end up killing fewer animals because um, you do not have non-target effects. You don't end up having indiscriminate killing by um, the local people, the, by local communities of everything that comes into their farms or whatever it is. So I'm going to stop there. Um, but those, those two chapters are sort of interlinked. One sort of leads on to the other. Thanks. Thank you, Soggy. Sorry. Yep. Uh, just a quick question then. So do you review effectiveness? Because I'm, I'm aware of good anecdotal stories of it. It's an individual animal that is causing a problem as opposed to the population of animals causing a problem. But I think I've always struggled to get good citations for that, good case studies. So are there good case studies demonstrating that, yes, there are occasions this can be effective? So. The, I mean, the problem is the case studies are sort of flooded with media. There was that tigress in India that killed people and she was killed and she had cubs and there was all kinds of media spin-offs and you think, oh, okay, that was a bad media management, basically. Uh, there are good case studies, um, mainly with things like tigers. Um, there was a leopard that was killed in northern India as well that was killing a lot of... Speaking of the language you use, it was lifting children. I mean... But 
Okay, um, so child lifting is the term used in India quite a lot and, and Nepal. Um, so there are a few case studies, but do you know what? Often the things that have surprised me is where you think you've done it and it doesn't work. So in the UK, for example, um, there was that project, I think you were even part of that, call, uh, dealing with what they called rogue animals. Um, it was funded by DEFRA. Um, how effective is it to remove rogue, rogue animals? And we found, we did a big uh, literature review, and only in about 10% or 15% of the cases it actually worked. It really is a last case, last resort thing to do. And actually you do a lot of harm if you don't do it properly. Um, so what was happening was they started using, I mean fish farmers in Scotland started using nets that were pinging to scare ske seals away and what they ended up doing was creating a, a, a suction effect for all the deaf seals in the area coming in to eat fish because the other seals didn't like the noise but the, the deaf ones didn't really care. Uh, and then they had to shoot these deaf ones but they were often big adult males so you created a population a, a level effect where you uh, disrupted the actual population social structure and it was a bit, bit of a mess. I mean that, popula that population took a while to restabilize again. Thank you. Thanks, Soggy. I, I just wanted to add another kind of related perspective um, to the issue, because of course no, no one, or pretty much no one, wants to kill animals, of course. Um, but I'm thinking back to a, and it, it's kind of a reply to you as well, and a case study. So I, I worked for a very long time with uh, a lot of Indonesian friends and colleagues in uh, Sumatra, and in one national park there, Way Canvas National Park, there was uh, an elephant that was a, a large male elephant that was extremely well, um, it was extremely easy to recognize because of uh, only had one tusk and a number of other marks on him and they had a name and Dougal actually, the, given how dangerous he was, it was a slightly odd name for him. Uh, and he killed about 20 people in the course of about two years. Um, and it was clear evidence that it was this elephant. And ultimately, the villagers killed him. And, and you know, you can probably understand why they would, right? Um, and so I think in those kind of circumstances, um, arguably the more humane thing to do is for professionals who know what they're doing to kill the animal in a way that maximizes the chance of it being you know, a good death, not a, a painful, prolonged death. Because too often we see in, in Asia and Africa elephants that are wounded by people because they've been stabbed with a spear or something. They don't die. They live un horribly unpleasant lives for many years afterwards, but also often very dangerous as a result of that because they're in pain and they're intelligent animals that associate the pain they're in with the people, or, or people, not the people, but just people generally that are responsible for the pain. And so. It, taking out those kind of animals in a humane way is often the most effective way to reduce other people being killed and other elephants being killed and just reducing the overall level of conflict. Going back to the point that Josh made earlier on, you know, much of human wildlife conflict is conflict between people over wildlife. And if people are massively angry because one or two elephants or other animals are killing people, you can completely undermine any support for elephant conservation in that area or indeed even in the country with a lot of elephants being killed in retaliation as a result. So I think it's worth keeping that thought in mind. Thank you. And uh, I'll just add really quickly to that. Um, so one of, one of the things that um, often happens is there's no clear chain of roles and responsibilities. Um, and if, for example, you are managing an NGO and you sometimes get called in to manage um, problem animals, whether it's lethally or, or, or through translocation or whatever it might be, um, you have to be very careful because you often, because there's no infrastructure, no government infrastructure or agency infrastructure in place, governments like to pass the risk to NGOs because 
or, and that's, um, that's a very cynical viewpoint, but they've passed the risk because they don't have the infrastructure, the, the training isn't there. So this is where it definitely is a very multi-stakeholder, cross-sectoral approach. You need a combination of NGOs, animal behavior, people who know how to shoot things or kill things or trap things, um, ecologists, social scientists. You can't just go in and kill something and walk away. Um, I'm going to stop there. Thank you. It's just to point out a slightly different context on this is that for centuries, wildlife management has been a process of sustainably harvesting, killing abundant wildlife, often with the intention of balancing conflict and resources, you know, with like deer damage, vehicle collisions, crop damage. This is a whole institutional framework based around using constant killing as a way of harvesting a resource and balancing conflict levels. So kind of, it's not only the selective removal of endangered species, which is a lethal issue. It can be shooting you know, hundreds of thousands of deer every year as part of this too. So there's many different contexts that we need to take into account. Um, right, great. Well, thank you. This one. Thanks, Sogi and Simon and, and um, John for those additional bits and bobs. Um, and yeah. No, I'm not going to. We, we need to move on because we've got now the 15 minutes. We're going to go into the last sample chapter, which is Simon Hedges is going to talk to us about um, avoiding unintended consequences, which kind of leads on from this. So what do, we, what do we mean by unintended consequences? Well, another story perhaps from uh, my couple of decades working in Indonesia with uh, a lot of Indonesian colleagues, um, a lot of it on elephants. Um, Many of you will have seen Lucy King's work on uh, using bees as a, a way of keeping elephants, deterring elephants from entering crop fields and so on. Uh, Lucy spoke yesterday. Many of you probably saw her very good talk. Um, and some of my colleagues in Indonesia had seen some of the, the papers and reports that Lucy and her colleagues um, from Save the Elephants had, had produced and were inspired to try the idea of using uh, beehives to keep elephants out of crop fields in uh, Sumatra. I, I was a little bit skeptical, and Lucy and I have had a long, many year conversation about the value of, of bees or otherwise. Um, but we tried it, and we put up a, a series of beehives around the, the perimeter of quite a few villages um, and monitored what happened. And the main thing which happened is we attracted sun bears down to the edge of the park <laughs> and created a, an additional human wildlife conflict problem that wasn't in existence before and, and did pretty much nothing to reduce human elephant conflict. That's not to say that bees can't be useful in certain contexts, as Lucy and her colleagues have, have shown. But that, I mean, that's, that's a good example of an unintended consequence. I mean, some other ones that probably many of you are aware of things like putting up electric fences or other kinds of fences and then the wire gets cut and, and used to make snares. Um, and so a lot of wildlife ends up getting killed and, and dying unpleasant deaths and there's holes in the fences. Um, if you're effective in one area using whatever means you are, you're trying uh, and actually successfully reducing human wildlife conflict in your, your, your um, project area, it, quite common, you're just displacing the problem to somewhere else nearby. So the elephants or tigers or whatever it is that were causing problems in this area are now just causing a problem a few miles away. Um, there's the so-called moral hazard problem associated with compensation schemes and in some cases insurance schemes as well, where if you're actually compensating farmers effectively for loss of cows or loss of um, crops, um, or they're getting insurance payments, um, they're actually encouraged to expand into, let's say, protected areas because they're actually being able to grow crops much more effectively. And so you end up in, in, causing encroachment issues into uh, wildlife areas. So there's a whole range of, and that's just a few examples. The chapter that um, we wrote on this has a, a number of other examples as well. So how do we avoid them, which obviously is the key thing? Um, Critically, of course, you need to think about the likely unintended consequences at the planning stage and make sure all reasonable efforts to, to avoid them have been taken. And that is also going to very much involve 
proper conversations with all relevant stakeholders from the word go, which is a principle which is emphasized right throughout the guidelines, the importance of co-designing things from the word go, not you know, a year into the process or something, but developing the, the projects in a genuine co-design fashion with, with all the stakeholders. And during that period, actually, you know, be very transparent and honest. Everyone needs to be thinking about what could go wrong and what, you know, might well go wrong based on experiences in other places and, and take whatever steps are needed to, to avoid them, the likelihood of them coming up. Making sure that all the stakeholders are you know, aware of the likely risks um, and accept those risks. You know, because nothing, we're never going to know in advance whether something's going to work properly or not. Um, there's always going to be some risks of something going wrong. And you need to make sure that all the stakeholders are fully on board with that. Um, of course, not all unintended consequences are, are predictable. Um, if they were, perhaps we would have fewer of them. But um, so the way. We're encouraging dealing with that is to make sure that there is, you know, a real um, effective attempt, not attempt, an effective process for reporting protocols. So we have really early warning of something going wrong, that there's proper monitoring and evaluation. There's a whole separate chapter and, and or set of chapters related to monitoring and evaluation in the guidelines. And making sure that there's genuine adaptive management. So if something's starting to go wrong, the monitoring and the reporting of what's going wrong is immediately feeding into the design of the project and, the, and, the, and uh, the, the management of the project. And we, we take steps to stop doing the thing which is causing the problem and, and bring something else on board. Um, and so, of course, good communication is, is, is very much key to that. Um, so regular meetings with all the stakeholders are involved. So everyone is aware of what's going on. And if something has started to go wrong, hopefully you catch it early and you're in a position where you can actually all work together to think of a, a new approach, whether it's a tweak to the existing method, or whether it's actually abandoning that method and switching to something else, or um, you know, consulting more widely with other people who have worked on the species and the, the types of situation and bringing in novel ideas and so on. Um, but you know, a really genuine approach to adaptive management. So I think I'll, I think I'll stop there because we're kind of running quite short on time, um, but happy to take any questions. Thank you so much. Uh, I have a general question. In, this, in these guidelines, among most of the contributors, there is not a single author who is from Central Asia. There is not a single author who is from MENA region, which is Middle East and North Africa. There is not a single mention of how you are going to manage the conflict in war-torn areas. The only time the word of war is mentioned is in the prospect that how you are going to make a sentence look more optimistic. There is not a single mention of how you are going to manage the conflict around the border areas. So how are you going to do, because when we see the, most of the people in war torn areas are the ones who are below the poverty line. And this, these guidelines, they are just seem that something written by the people of the North to tell people of the South how do, you are going to do these things. Do you want to take one? Put one. Well. I think the, the thrust of the question was that there was few authors from um, South Asia and other other countries. Um, there are there are several authors from South Asia. Uh, sorry, from India was that? All the authors were mostly from India. There are no authors from Central Asia or Middle East, where there is wars going on. There is lots of conflict going on around the animals over there. I think the, the questioner was saying that all of the South Asians were from India. We've got over 50 authors. I can't remember all of them off the top of my head, I have to say. Um, I mean, diversity of authors is not there. Sorry, There's say no, again? I mean, that diversity of authors is not there. Most of the authors that are from Asia are either from India or Bhutan, maybe. But India is not the part of that. India is just one country in South Asia and Central Asia. Okay. Um, so, so I can't remember the entire list of, of all the 50 plus authors and their nationalities, but there are quite a number of countries represented from, from 
Right. I, th I think I understand your point. Um, it wasn't quite the question I was expecting, but I think it is an, it's an important one. Um, as I say, there are, maybe if I could just answer it. Yeah. I, I, yeah, I think if I remember rightly from working at CITES and so on, um, there is something like 196 countries in the world. I think it's roughly that. Um, there are approximately 50 authors of the of the guidelines, so it wouldn't be possible to have a representation from every every country, right? Maybe if you could use the microphone, it's a little bit hard to, to hear what you're saying. Sorry. Yeah. So what about the war war torn regions? What about those countries where war is going on? We we did our best to represent quite a number of regions, including in you know, across Just Asia. Region across aside, how you are going to address human wildlife conflict in war prone areas? Where there is an ongoing war going on, how you are going to address the conflicts in those areas? I think it's an important point. I've I've tried to answer it to the best of my ability. I think Alex wants to say something. Okay. <laughs> now, okay. now listen. So here is the thing. The, and yes, this, the initial author group, so we started this with a small task force that was a little north biased because this is how the group started. It has since expanded quite a lot and, and become more regionally representative. The thing that's always very difficult with these things is you cannot work with hundreds and hundreds of people to produce something like this. It is not possible. So there's a core group of authors who produced the first attempt at this. This is what we're doing, and we're saying here's our first attempt. Now, what I wanted to use the last 10 minutes for um, was actually to ask you, what's the next step? So we've started with something because it, because it is easier to start involving a bigger community with something other than a blank page. Um, and so how can we now start to bring in all the localized lessons and knowledge and wisdoms and populate and add that on. And so what we will actually want to suggest is let's use this as a kind of a platform and now start populating this with worked examples and ex you know lessons learned and tests of, does this work in Afghanistan? Does it work in Malta? Does it work in Paraguay? Does it work for sharks? Does it work for um, whatever it is? So this now needs to be used. That's what we want. And so we want to see, does, is it useful for policymakers? Is it useful for those in the finance sector? What do you, is other sort of maybe shorter versions of it that can be adapted for a different kind of sectors? And so we have, a, we actually have, you know, five minutes left where we wanted to propose exactly that. So thank you for raising that. Um, and so I should say that kind of the next steps in all this, this is, it's quite an effort to start to even articulate the, the huge, I mean, even just the questions showed how many angles there are to this. And we've tried to capture most of that in what is quite a long document. This is 260 pages long, and we've been trying to keep it succinct. Um, so what we want to do next is several things. One is what I just suggested is let's then involve a much bigger community of knowledge and practitioners um, to add to this. And we'd like your suggestions maybe over the remaining days and beyond um, what you'd like to do. The second thing we wanna do is translate this into a number of different languages. Um, and so we just need to do a little fundraising for that. A few thousand dollars per language are needed. We'll start with all of the UN languages plus Portuguese and several South Asian languages and anything else that is suggested. So that's easily done, um, except it just needs a little money to do. And as it's a digital copy, you know, that also keeps the cost down. And then ultimately what we also want to do is explore whether this can be turned into a uh, training um, platform program of some sort that is again so using this as kind of the framework and then adapting to all the different kind of scenarios, languages, contexts, etc. 
So I think I'd like you to see this as a document, as a starting point to launch all sorts of other things. But this means um, everybody who's interested in it actually getting involved and suggesting things. So we have a few more minutes. Um, are there any more general questions or specific ones? And to any of us. So I'll go with York first and then come over here. Yes, thank you very much for this presentation. To me as a practitioner, it looks like a very useful checklist that I can use when I go to the field. So I appreciate the effort very much and we'll certainly be looking at that. One idea that came to my mind when I was listening to you was that, and also that's my experience with all our intentions to avoid unintended consequences, they tend to happen um, quite a lot. And um, so one thought I have about that is the importance to understand systems and their behavior and to have a special look at that when we work with the communities and also when we work with nature and to understand these interactions also on a deeper level, um, on the scientific level where things can be observed, but also on the level of motivations and feelings. Um, the colleague was also mentioning our own perceptions and our own awareness that we bring to that and that we are not always aware of that. So there are many subtle factors. So I think these things, probably they are included, but I think it's important to, to stress them because I think the unintended consequences, they, they often come from these levels. Thanks very much. And just to say, because I'm familiar with your area as well, that there are three chapters in here that are about um, dialogue and conflict resolution, that kind of thing as well. So there's a number more fields in there. I think it was a question on this side. Hi, good morning. Um, thank you for your presentation and looking forward to going through the guidelines. Um, just in case this question isn't there, please forgive me. Um, I was just curious if there's a specific checklist that can be utilized in the determination um, if you're dealing with a, a problem animal. Um, I know in theory what it is, uh, but I don't think I've seen anywhere that if a specific animal does X, Y, and Z, or these amount of people are affected, this amount of loss has essentially um, been incurred in a specific area, then we can call this, this is, this is basically a problem animal and maybe culling or some other drastic uh, measure needs to be taken. I'm asking, because I'm, I'm from Guyana, um, I do know of a few instances where a few things happen and um, you know, people are, are quickly, uh, people are, feel very strongly and want to see animal be killed. And I know there are specific instances if it's in, let's say we're dealing with jaguar conflict, if it's an older jaguar, um, and you're realizing there are a few issues and it's the same animal, um, well then in that instance, sure, you might uh, want to go out there and call the animal, but just just asking in general if there's a specific checklist. Or um, this actually, well, I'm going to let maybe Sagi reply to that, but it, it spans across several chapters, but a checklist for identifying and dealing with problem animals, it's kind of covered in yours, isn't it? So, um, yeah, the, basically the way I sort of approached this chapter was Different places, different countries have different criteria um, for how they actually approach or, or deal with this thing. So definitely identifying the animal is definitely one thing. And there is a checklist of it within there. So I've, I've taken uh, examples, but I've sort of generalized it a little bit and tried to create a, a principle-based checklist rather than case-specific check checklists. And I, and I think what um, Alex was saying before, especially after that question also from Pakistan, the, the entire guidelines, you have to remember one thing, it's not necessarily a geographic representation, it's a principles-based 
representation, which we are now going to flesh out with case examples and te through testing the different chapters and stuff like that. So s certainly examples from the Jaguar situation would be one. Certainly examples from Pakistan, we, I mean, it would be critical to see these things. We have to flesh out this. This is just the skeleton. We now need some flesh on the bones. Thanks, Sagi. We're actually slightly over time, so I'm going to suggest let's wrap this up here because I'm sure everybody would like a coffee break now. Um, but let's keep, you know, chatting about this, and we're going to think about how to maybe um, expand. It's just on a simple web page right now, but we're going to have a look at whether there's some sort of something can be built there to keep this conversation going. So thanks very much, and um, see you later.